Well, how would you feel if I were to tell you that this piece that you've known for ever and that you probably all like very much, in fact, should be played rather like this? <laughs> Chopin has actually betrayed you. So that's one of the many fascinating uh, facets of tempo research. It's a sort of world where nothing is quite like it seems it should be. Um, I'm aware that the title of this talk and uh, the briefing might sound a little dry. I can assure you that there's nothing dry about research in tempo. And I hope that by the end of this talk, I will have convinced you that this is the case. I'm talking to you from Clare Hall. Uh, good evening if you are watching this live. Hello if you are watching it at any other time. Um, this is a first for me because I am doing a non-scripted talk. So I hope you will have the patience to cope with my possible hesitation. So I would like to start by broadcasting you this. <laughs> see my central argument is that there is no other parameter of interpretation that bears such a strong weight on the whole on the conception as a whole than tempo therefore I feel we should pay a lot of attention on the choice of our tempo when we decide to play a piece uh, this is something on which we should give very much consideration um, however, this is not always the case. Uh, there is a certain inbred laziness in our attitude to this respect, mainly because we know music that we play through different interpretation. We sort of know what we like and we tend to naturally do either what we've been taught or what we heard and what we tended to like the most. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that per se, but it does limit us in some ways because it means that we may enter a world where we are the heir of traditions or we are where we are simply copying each other ad infinitum. Uh, this is not always how it unfolds, but there is a significant aspect of this, and that I will try to demonstrate tonight. Um, so, yes, you have some exceptions to this rule. You have, as always, and again, that will come strongly in this program, people whose temperament, whose nature is geared towards either abnormally fast playing, and the uh, case in point, for example, in the world of the piano would be Martha Argerich, who just naturally feels more comfortable when she's playing fast than slow. And you are, have also, although this is these days more rare, people who naturally feel comfortable slowing down. That tends to happen to people who age. Um, they just take a more leisurely ap approach to things, but not only. So, those things bear some weight into the decision of which tempo you are going to play. And of course, 
then there is a whole question of acoustic instrument and like that. So at no point in this talk you will hear me saying that there is a right tempo for a piece of music. Uh, that is simply far too simplistic. Uh, it's a combination of so many different factors coming together, your temperament, what the composer wanted, uh, the tradition, your mood, the acoustics, the piano. It's a very complicated thing. Uh, and uh, you yourself might play the same piece at very different tempi on different days. But anyway, um, all I'm saying is that, as always, it is better that one's decisions are informed, uh, that you don't walk blindly into just playing a piece at the tempo you always heard it without questioning this first. And when you do, which is what I have done since a few years, as uh, will know the followers of my channel, you do really uncover some fascinating facts and it's, it's a few of those that I will want to share with you tonight. I would like to argue that as far as tempo research is concerned, there is an AD and a BC and that is really the cutting point is the invention of the metronome. So that everything which is before is more shrouded in mystery uh, than clear fact. Everything that comes after has at least this tangible point on which we can hang ourselves, although even then nothing is nearly as simple as we might have thought and perhaps composer might have thought it was. But anyway, I will start in my beginning, which is the Baroque age. And as far as tempo research goes, this one is a really complicated one. We have almost no certain facts to hang on. And it is further complicated by the fact that often composers, and Bach is a case in point, didn't write very much at all in terms of tempo. Most scores by Bach won't even have any tempo indication where in most pieces of music you will at least see Allegro, Allegretto, Presto there. And though you might argue endlessly what is the exact meaning of Andante, at least you have that to hang on to. When you don't even have it, then modern people are confronted with a problem. Because although a lot of those things that are going to feel perfectly natural for someone living in uh, 1720. Well, times have changed, uh, our perception of time have changed, our knowledge of the various dance forms that people used at the time uh, has totally disappeared. So if Bach is writing an Allemande, well, it's all very well, but Somebody, for example, like Di Lillipati, who was an absolutely wonderful pianist uh, and played, recorded in Partita in 1950, you could see had absolutely zero knowledge of what the sort of speed of an Allemand was, and he played it something like that, and you will have to excuse me because it's about minus 10 in this room, and my fingers are really cold, but he played something like this. <laughs> much about Baroque speed, but we do, not, we do know that this is not uh, accurate historically. Uh, and I think he probably didn't. We know that today probably it would be fine around this speed. Uh, sort of, well, a more leisurely form of a dance. Um, it is an interesting field, uh, tempo research in the Baroque era, because we might have think, thought that with the uh, historically informed practice movements that emerged actually around the 60s, uh, shortly after Lipati, 
we might have brought more certainty in. And in fact, just listening to a few recordings quite clearly shows that this is not the case. Um, those of you who have listened to my talk on the 48 Freedom Fugues uh, will have realized quite early on that this is a subject that matters to me. And you might have heard of my uh, talk on the Tempo Ordinario. If you have not, I'll very briefly say it. The Baroque age had this concept of what is called the Tempo Ordinario, which means that in a classic, in a piece of music that looks average with no really modifying factor, uh, you could actually have a good idea of the tempo that it was uh, by this concept of te tempo ordinario, which derived roughly on the human pulse, and that we estimate situated anywhere between 60 and 80 pulses per minute. So uh, the heartbeat acted as a sort of pre-metronome, if you want. And we do know that Handel relied on it, we do know that Bach relied on it, and probably many other composers too. Um, if you decide to go with it, and I certainly do, it opens some fascinating prospects and it completely transforms a lot of pieces that we thought we knew very well. And the example I gave in my talk was about the second Bach prelude, which is, has traditionally for decades or perhaps even centuries, in fact, been played something like this. <laughs> dictates something which is more like this. And uh, there are ways to get a clue that this is probably correct. Uh, there are ways in the notation to s look uh, to say, well, actually in some pieces this is really the only tempo which is going to work decently well, particularly on a harpsichord. However, uh, even in the contemporary Baroque world, you do see that players who do adopt routinely the rule of tempo ordinario are actually probably still in the minority. And in fact, the, uh, the Baroque movement came with a tremendous uh, rise in the speed of interpretation generally and we can argue that in some ways it was justified and warranted because pre metronome well pre uh, HIP movement you could easily hear things like this which today would be very hard sort of monumentality is, is, it has its wonderful qualities, but it's absolutely not authentic. However, can we say that this is more authentic? sure. To me, the first one is too slow, the second one is too fast. But again, a lot of this is speculative. And if we think that we are the first generation to really speculate on what sort of speech should Baroque music be played, well, the news is we are not. And I will run to some amusing discrepancy on to what happened historically with, uh, with this music. A few years after Bach's death was born Czerny in 1791, so 41 years after Bach's death. 
and Xiandi edited heavily the works of Bach. Uh, a lot of it, Partita, Invention, uh, Goldberg, and Asian, you know that. And Xiandi thought it absolutely reasonable that Bach would play, and again, you will have to excuse my fingers, that Bach would be played like this. <laughs> speed seemed absolutely fine. In fact, he did even give a warning in his edition to say that those are the metronome by metronome numbers. Do, if you don't have a metronome, do bear in mind that this music should be played uh, less fast than the music that we hear today, which actually does bring into question, well, what sort of speed did he have in mind for the music of his time if that seemed to him less fast than... Uh, uh, but again, he thought that... Uh, <laughs> Again, uh, today most people would play somewhere around a and some people even slower. So we can see that even such a short time after Bach's generation, the world, the, the conception of music uh, which had moved from Baroque to classical and even early Romantic. Uh, has changed so much that Xiaoli was essentially no longer in touch with that world. He had lost it. And on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a chap called Krug. Now, Krug, there is not a lot that we know about him, except that he gravitating, gravitated in uh, Nietzsche's circle. And as Nietzsche himself was apparently a very good pianist, and uh, very close to Wagner, as we know. Again, his opinions on tempo are not uninteresting. Now, Krug was born in 1805, so uh, again, only 40 years after Czerny. But his take for a piece that should be roughly played like this. Today, let me find the score. Now, Krug thought it really was meant to be played like this. And that is not at all an exception. Krug edited quite a lot of uh, Bach concertos, and the first time I looked at his metronome mark, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, what is wrong with the chap? Because they are all completely outside of our experience. For example, the second movement of the same piece, which any Baroque ensemble today would play. <laughs> as slow. So what is interesting is that from a few generations after Bach, we have two people born a few years apart who both have ideas about this music which is absolutely pulled apart. It can't even be begin to be reconciled. Uh, they have moved into territories and that discrepancy persists largely almost to the present day, although you would be hard pressed to find today somebody who would play Bach as hope speed. But um, yeah, so the, the Baroque age is a tricky one. 
Now, there are some interesting quotes that I would like to give you, which almost confuse us more, in fact, but nonetheless, there is a chap called Quant, who used to be a flute player, and wrote a method uh, of flute playing, in which he has a chapter on tempo, which is uh, really interesting. He talks about the tempo denial and other things. He wrote in 1752, so two years after Bach's death, and he notes that what in former times was considered to be quite fast would have to be played almost twice as slow, slow as in the present day. So he indicated already by his time a long-term acceleration of tempo that was corroborated by uh, other contemporary writers. Uh, all later writer, among which another chap called Thomas Jung, who was born in 1773. British polymath who made notable contributions in the field of vision, light, solid mechanics, energy, physiology, language, musical harmony, and Egyptology. He was a Renaissance man, very good. He, he wrote actually a great deal about music, and it was interesting because thanks to him, we can know something about speeds in the classical age, about which we again, like the Baroque age, we know precious little, really. Um, Jung says that the maximum allowable tempo for Allegro seems to have risen by about 50% during the half century between 750 and 800. So on one hand, you have Quant telling you that between 700 and 750, the speed doubled. And then you have Jung who arrived and said, tell you that between 750 and 800, the speed also doubled. So that <laughs> brings into question where, what speed did play people uh, in, the, uh, in the early 18th century? I mean, maybe Krug was right, in fact. Um, it means that Czerny certainly wasn't but maybe the, the speed. And Jung did all kind of measurements uh, with the help of a pendulum. And he was not alone in doing that. There was maybe two other people doing it. One was called Mason, the other one was called Crotch. I think they were all Englishmen, actually. Uh, and tried to, uh, to give some sort of estimate of what was the speed for Haydn, what was the speed for Mozart, and, and other people that interest us a lot less, like Pleyel, when we, nobody really bothered you know, to know exactly what Pleyel wanted his symphony to be played, but it would be very interesting for us to know what speed Mozart wanted for his music, and the fact is we know very little. But so Thomas Jung and a few others, with the help of a pendulum, tried to draw charts and, and draw some conclusions. They that's where, again, as everything in tempo is complicated, they don't all agree with each other. If you can get some ground rules, and that will come time and time again from the second part of the 18th century onward, is that slow movements were not all that slow. Uh, every time we see a slow movement today, we tend to really bring the speed down severely. Everything indicates from that moment in time that actually this was not the case. And apparently Haydn's slow movements were much faster than we think. In fact, the uh, seven last word of the Christ uh, apparently has some timings which are completely shocking today because although it's a slow word, it's famously seven slow movements, apparently it was not anywhere near as slow as we do it these days. Um, but Again, we can only take what they say with a pinch of salt because they don't all agree with each other. We know, for example, that menuet should be played infinitely faster than we play them today, but we don't know a lot more. One thing that I uncovered quite by accident about two days ago and that I find absolutely fascinating is the following. And that's one I want to find. Yeah, here it is. You Probably many of you will have heard this aria from Mozart's uh, The Magic Flute, which is called Ach, Ich Fühls. Well, apparently there was, uh, in a music magazine, somebody, and I now forget the name, uh, raised the issue that he thought 
the speed of that area. And that was writing in the um, probably early 19th century. Uh, so a, a few years after Mozart's death, saying that he thought the speed of that area had been going down quite steadily to a point that it was quite different from what Mozart originally intended. And then somebody wrote back a few months later and said, yes, uh, I know people who have played this under, under Mozart's direction, and they confirm. And in fact, we do have measurement of someone who said that the speed should be that. Uh, now, I'll play you the beginning of this aria as it is played today, and the interpretation is completely standard. I mean, there is very little variation in what we can hear today in this absolutely wonderful, wonderful aria. Wait a minute. has come down as being the proper tempo for this speed. Because we have a pendulum measurement, we can convert it in metronome number, and we know that actually Mozart heard that. And I had to play it myself because there is no recording anywhere that will even begin to approach the speed that Mozart wanted, which is... as fast. And that again brings back to this idea that when we see Andante today, we categorize it into the, the top of the slow movement section. And for all the composers from Mozart up to the present day, Andante actually meant something quite different that still had, well, a flowing quality that we seem to have completely lost. We will see it later on again. But that is fascinating because it's a rare glimpse of us knowing what Mozart wanted, and we know that we are completely wrong. So it can only make us think, well, where else are we completely wrong then? Um, unfortunately, a lot of it is going to be guesswork. I want to briefly talk about another oddity, because again, the world of tempo is full of oddities. Again, another man called Vincent Novello, who was again an English, so there are a lot of Englishmen in this tempo uh, research field. Son of an Italian who married an English wife, was born in London. Uh, he's best known as a publisher, uh, but he is also well known for having brought big choral works to England, uh, among which Haydn's Oratorio, Mozart, things like this. And he gave us his metronome marks for Mozart Requiem. And they are fascinating because they are at odds with everything I just said, in fact. And again, he was born at a time where um, Mozart was still alive, uh, 1781. And I think he even met Mozart's widow. Um, and he's, uh, I'll play you the, the Kirelli, I mean, I'll play you the first few lines of the Kirillis, and again I have to play it because no recording matches that. He thought that an adequate tempo would be this. Unbelievably ponderous. The whole requiem is like this, and I won't run through all the numbers, but instead of a... He's like a mother would be... So, again, uh, we are talking of someone who lives, well, the next generation, and already he's on a completely different track. Now, you can argue here that this was for massive choral forces in England. Probably, uh, this is a transcription for organ, 
with a big organ in a you know perhaps in a big cathedral so that he was taking into account acoustic effects you could argue that uh, and in fact you'd better argue that otherwise you are really lost to understand any of it but yes it is uh, just one of these curious phenomenon of tempo now i would want to move on to the cutting point which we will call ludwig van beethoven because from his time we do have some more precise measurements because he was one of the first well he was the first of the great musician to endorse the use of the metronome and unfortunately for us pianists he hasn't left us a lot of metronome mark in fact there is only one sonata that he has marked himself and sadly it happens to be the hammerklavier and sadly it's about the most problematic metronome mark in history because to this day i don't think there is one pianist who can successfully pull it off uh, it would run something like this <laughs> it's not sustainable a uh, schnabel tried and he failed miserably uh, since then some people with some even sharper technique have but there is a point uh, is it desirable and is it possible um, it may just about be possible it almost certainly is not desirable and the fact is that this metronome mark has been disputed by about everyone even by beethoven contemporary even ever since it appeared so it's very sad that the only one that we have for his piano music is so contentious but we have all the symphonies and all the string quartets and that's very interesting because they are quite extreme but they are reachable on the whole and they tell us something interesting about the music uh, about the elementary drive in Beethoven music uh, the constant sense of motion uh, that modern interpretation up to a point have largely lost if you do remember the uh, the opening of my talk and i broadcasted two different versions of the fifth symphony well one was celibidace who okay i took it for to make a case in point he is very well known for his broad slow tempi and that was indeed probably the slowest version of beethoven 5 that uh, exists uh, the other one is a really modern version by Kuranzis, who I think is actually playing at Beethoven's metronome mark. And that was the first time I heard Beethoven's symphony played at the right metronome mark. And I have to say, I find it just absolutely incredible. It completely changed the perspective on the, on the piece. And it makes me understand now why it had such a powerful effect on the people who listened to it. Uh, there is an anecdote that Berlioz uh, tells when he took his own teacher who was, I can't remember his name, but uh, he really, I mean, the teacher was, Beethoven was new, a revolutionary, and people were quite weary of him. And he forced him to come to perform the Beethoven fight. And the chap just lost it. He became livid and he said, well, I've never heard anything like this in my life. I don't even know whether I like it or not, but the effect was so powerful. And hearing that sort of interpretation makes you understand why it can have been so incredibly groundbreaking. And I think that's something we have lost uh, in, to a point. Now, if we don't have Beethoven marks for his piano sonata, we are very lucky because we have sets of metronome marks for each of them, both by Moshles and Czerny, who both knew Beethoven well. Now, we know that Czerny can be a bit extreme because we've seen his bar but Moshles is not particularly and anyway the two of them tend to adjust uh, each other sometimes they come to a consensus sometimes they disagree a bit but it does give you a good idea of okay are we roughly doing the right thing or is it really different from what it used to be and the answer is sometimes it's okay sometimes it's actually quite different and once again it's almost a running theme through this talk is the slow movements are always faster so for example, we don't, I mean, they don't do a which is very nice, but they would do a 
surprise in some ways is not the fast movements. The fast movements on the whole are more or less what we are doing. But the slow movements really are a bit of a shock. Uh, and of that we can really take something uh, for us that is, I think, of value. After Beethoven, then we enter the Romantic Age. And here it's sort of the golden age of tempo research because Practically, with some major exception like Brahms or Liszt, who left us almost no metronome marks, practically all of them have really uh, left us quite a lot for their music. And so we can really have a global picture that, that is coherent, interesting, and on which we can get some solid facts at last. Uh, and today I want to concentrate on two of these and on two works specifically. I will take the case of Schumann and of Chopin. And I want to discuss a few of the Chopin etudes and a few of the Schumann Kinderzenen. I don't want this talk to last until midnight, so when I say a few, it might be one or two. Um, so uh, again, a Schumann, a lot of metronome marks. Today, nobody takes them. I, I think nobody even looks at them. Uh, or maybe we look at it once and we okay, he was probably mad. Uh, let's do our own thing. Uh, where we have a possible indication that we are wrong is that Schumann had a wife who played the piano rather well and also taught. And she recorded. Uh, she, she didn't record, unfortunately, but quite a few of her students actually lived up to the 1960s and recorded uh, quite a bit. And in fact, we have three recordings of Schumann's Kinderzimmern by Clara Schumann students. So it's very good because, again, you can get an average. And well, one average is that the speeds today for Kinderzimmern as a whole ranges between 19 and 20 minutes. The speed of those three recording is 14 minutes, so uh, in total. So they are much, much faster. And again, all the faster pieces are played pretty much in the same way in old and recent recording. But for the old one, here is Adelina de Lara, who was one of the best known of Clara Schumann students, playing the first of Schumann's Kinderzimmern. Well, not since you tell me you want to behave, which is not. Well, that's not the one I want. This is the one I want. Now, this is Adelina de Lara. Now, this is Daniel Trifonov at the Carnegie Hall uh, a few years ago. And the sound is not very good in the recording, but I hope you can hear it. Now, I have actually taken the trouble to measure the speed of the two recording, and it's extremely interesting. Adelina de Lara is exactly at Schumann's tempo, which is 128. Trifonov is exactly half as fast. So, in 80 years, we've lost half the speed of the Okay, Trifonov is a little bit extreme, but most of the uh, people will do that. Will do that. You will find very few people doing it. And if we 
take another one uh, as the most famous one, which is Traumerei. Again, what we are used to since Horowitz plays this piece as an encore in Moscow is something like this. as a sort of norm, if you want. And uh, I, I won't play you tough enough also because it will take me too much time to read it. But he does exactly that. In fact, he even goes slower sometimes. Um, again, Schumann's tempo is... A... constant in Schumann's work. Uh, the most fascinating one is probably the second movement of the concerto that everybody plays. And Schumann has written something like... So it's simply a different piece. Um, so, you might think, okay, but Schumann has a sort of history of mental illness. He was probably an enthusiast, and uh, he wrote ten pieces that were on the whole on the faster side of things, probably too fast. And anyway, we also know that even Clara Schumann used to sometimes mark down his uh, metronome marks a little bit. Uh, she was a practical musician, and she obviously thought that sometimes they didn't work. But let's take Chopin, who was actually himself a pianist. And if we take either the Etudes or the Nocturnes, well, in the Etudes, the metronome marks are all faster than we expected them to be, pretty much without exception. Now, there are some interesting things, and as always, with metronome marks. The faster one today some people reach, and indeed because Chopin etudes are what they are and they are competition material, there is a trend, which is relatively modern but not entirely, of playing them exactly as fast as is humanly possible, and therefore we have reached speeds that uh, are actually, I mean I will play you briefly a recording of one, I won't even tell you who the pianist is. He clocks somewhere like 180 for something, for the hardest of Chopin etudes, which Chopin has written at 138, which personally I find plenty. But this chap can do it. That's it. Anybody who has any experience of playing the piano will know that this is uh, bordering on the inhuman. Um, so that does happen to the fast etudes. But what is interesting is that this never translated to the few slow etudes that he actually wrote. Um, there are three genuinely etudes of expression. I won't say slow etudes because in fact Chopin did not intend them to be slow. But there are three etudes that in a competition you are not allowed to play because they are too easy, if you want. Uh, it's of course this one. Uh, then we have this one, which is normally played like this. And we have the beautiful uh, Opus uh, 25, number 7. would have run Then 
first other metronome marks by many other composers that I won't discuss here because, again, I'm not trying to be comprehensive. We can start to get a picture of a time. We actually know that those metronome marks were meant because we have historical documents of uh, interpreters timing how long would it take to uh, play, play a piece of music. And uh, well, you can reconstitute it, you can see that actually they did mean what they wrote. Uh, so, yeah, they were meant to be taken seriously. And this was a time where the music had the sense of constant flow uh, that was never completely contemplative. That doesn't seem to have belonged either to the classical age nor to the Romantic age. For the Baroque, the evidence is more mixed. We simply do not know very well. Or at least I think we don't know. Maybe some people think they know. Um, I think there is no clear evidence for that one. So, it begs interesting questions, uh, which is, why did that happen? You might argue, and there is a decent case for saying, well, okay, we are playing instruments which are completely different. The round, long tone of a modern Steinway like this one is completely different from the uh, rather thin Viennese piano for which Chopin wrote his work. And in fact, we do have documents again saying that, yes, those metronome marks were written because he was composing on this piano. He might have wanted to slow them down eventually when he, when he knew better pianos, which he did. Um, and it's a fact that you can't play on a forte piano exactly at the speed you play on a modern piano. This simply allows the sound to resonate. I mean, when well, you still hear it, you probably wouldn't hear it much anymore after two seconds on a Venice piano. So, but nonetheless, I, I believe there is more than that. I, I think there is a sort of urgency about the music making that makes it um, as things are constantly have a drive to them. It's almost as if today we look at this slow movement as a piece in a museum. We contemplate them, we, we bask in their beauty, but they are no longer quite as alive in the, in the dynamic way that they were when they were written. But something else that is interesting and on which I will try to finish is uh, there is a time, historically, where you can see that actually composers start to write metronome marks which are slower for their slow movements. So there is a time where presumably composers themselves started to play the work of their predecessors more slowly than they have been written. And the first I found to do that in a, in a way that is indisputable is Scriabin. Now, Scriabin was a Chopin fanatic in his youth. He was also a little bit of a madman, but not when he was young. And this is a prelude opus 11, number 15. Now, the traditional interpretation, which I found on YouTube, hopefully, it is very good for this, runs like this. If you, if you just take the text without looking at it, you will probably do this. Sorry, YouTube is trying to give me an ad, which I don't want. Now, this may seem decently slow to you. What Kevin has written is this. you get to understand why in a minute.
-hmm. So you see, it's what Kevin had in mind is something entirely different. It's something completely hypnotic, where by the end of the piece, your pulse will have slowed down, your perception of time will have been warped in a, in a completely <laughs> different way, and that you, you come to experience music as a sort of timeless thing. It's very modern. Uh, it's not very different from what Arvo Pair today or Morton Feldman are doing in some ways. is to put you in an altered state of consciousness. And I think Scriabin was one of the first to do that. And although this is extreme, what we are doing when we play slow movement from classical works extremely slowly is a, a more average version of that we try to create a, a timeless state in some ways. I mean, if I do that... Uh yes, it is beautiful, of course. But it is a different perception of time from what Chopin wanted. Now, if we move on to the 20th century, we find another composer who, like Scriabin, has synesthesia, like Scriabin, was on the edge of sanity. We have Olivier Messiaen, who wrote his Vingt Regards pour l'Enfant Jésus. That one is particularly interesting. Again, Messiaen was very influenced by Eastern conception of time. And when he wrote the first of his Vingt Regards, he wrote it for that sort of speed. something fascinating. He was married to Yvonne Loriot, who was herself a pianist, and she recorded twice as a regard. Well, look at her tempo. She is not far from being twice as fast as her husband uh, indicated in the score. And that actually does make you think and brings a serious question, which is, did composer really mind? How much did they bother about their metronome indications? We have here a clear modern example where he must have approved the recording. He must, in fact, he must have been there when it was recorded. And apparently he must have been reasonably happy with it. Now, we do know that there is no strict consensus about it. Ravel, for example, we know was very strict. If he wrote 92, it had, been, it had to be 92. Uh, and he would get very cross if somebody didn't. But we can't know exactly how much Chopin or Beethoven or... The, that will always remain a bit of a mystery. So, um, I want to conclude this talk in some ways. And... Um, what you should take from that, if you take anything, is that this is a field where there is very much hypothesis and very little facts that we can take for granted. Uh, at any period, however, any careful investigation will at least open the door to different ways of doing things that should run parallel to what we take for granted. Uh, I've never dared to play some of the pieces I play to you now at the speed of the composers because I, I just think they are so well known, the audience will think I'm an idiot or something like that. Maybe one day I will. I'm very glad to be aware of their existence. I think the speeds that I've highlighted all make sense. But there is not to say that the modern speeds that we also play make, do not have their own validities too. So, yeah, essentially it is a complex world where, where there is room for an exceptionally wide variety of approach. 
Uh, and it appears that masterpieces, and at least some of them, can support an incredibly diverse array of speed. And I think we should rejoice into this. Thank you very much. I would like to invite a dear friend to the platform and see if he has a few questions for me at this point. And I hope you will hear him, but through his mask. But uh, yeah. I'm sure he, will. He, may, he might take his mask off. Just he a might take his mask. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Patrick, for a fascinating lecture. It raises all sorts of questions which um, I, are impossible to ask um, in a short, short space of time. Maybe impossible to answer, Robert, so don't be... So <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to ask you a sort of rather basic question. It seems to me that the theme of your talk was a search for authenticity, mm -hmm. to find out exactly what was intended yep. by composers. I think if one went along this route too far, one would lose a great deal of richness. Indeed, it would be quite impossible to compare and contrast pieces if they were all played at the speed at which you considered the composer um, wanted, wanted them to be. And so I'd suggest to you that, in fact, this variation, a very wide variation in some cases, is to our benefit. I think we might also compare this in a slightly different way with arrangements of music. Um, we would be poorer, I think, if we didn't have Stokowski's um, arrangements of Bach's <laughs> organ pieces. And I, I would be very unhappy, therefore, if um, we all had to listen to precisely the same thing. And I haven't got much time to ask any more further questions, but I shall throw in one thing. And that is that audiences themselves change over time. And indeed, audiences at any one time are very diverse in any case. And I must say that one piece which I really felt um, the authenticity spoiled the effect was your example from um, Mozart's Magic Flute. And I've always loved that aria played at a slow pace um, because I think it is a sort of piece which requires slowness and thought. And I would be very unhappy if every time I heard it, I had to hear it at the authentic speed. Would you like to comment on some of these Oh, yes, yes, I would like uh, very much to comment. I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I'm not saying that we should look for authenticity so that we can say, okay, that's it, that's my tempo, uh, because that's the tempo of the composer. No, I think it's exceptionally good that we have a diversity approach, of approach. But I think, indeed, this is what any careful research in this domain will bring, is diversity of approach. Because if we don't try to look at these old documents, then we might assume that what we do is normal, and therefore we will all do it. Uh, I would like to hear pianists come on the stage today and do that. And the fact is, nobody does, uh, because nobody really bothers to look for what was originally written. Uh, I think all the approaches should coexist, and I like too much many work play at a much lower tempo than that. And I do it myself all the time. Um, I like it too much to object, but I think we learn something and we expand our musical consciousness when we embrace speeds that are different from the ones we have been looking. And I will come to the point of this Mozart aria. Apparently for Mozart, it expressed a sort of passionate longing and pain and it had to have this... Uh, you see, this sort of restless agitation. That's how he conceived it, that's what he wanted. And you can't get a good idea of what it might sound like with me playing it on the piano. But it would be fascinating to have one day a conductor trying to really do this, trying to make it work, and see if something can be brought to... Uh, yes, but I find what, the, the way you play just that, you lose what one might call contemplation. Yes. And I think contemplation in that particular aria is of extreme importance. I want to ask you one final question, because we really must finish now. Yep. And that is, do you think that when, where composers have actually given you tempo markings, mm -hmm. if they listen again, they might think, I got that wrong. I shouldn't have had it faster. I suppose it's like, I mean... You know, people who write books go over their editions um, a 
and make changes, yep. significant in some cases. And I would suggest to you sometimes that composers might actually want to do exactly the same thing. And they did. I mean, uh, we, ha we do have cases where we have two metronomes for one work. Uh, that does happen, even in Chopin Etude, actually. And, uh, and also, but you have to take into account that some of them were pretty careful, and when they did give a metronome mark, they had thought carefully about it. It was already perhaps some things that they had considered and changed, and something like that. If, it, if you want, it was their final throw of the dice. So, yes, of course they may change and they may hear, but we have to imagine that if that's what has been published, in many cases, if not all, it is roughly what they wanted. Yeah? yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed again, um, Patrick, for a, a wonderful talk. Um, I would like to remind those who are still listening that Patrick's going through the 48 um, Brilliant and Fugues of Bach. He's about halfway through. Every night except Saturday, every night of the week except Saturday, he's playing one of them and indeed introducing them with some ideas and thoughts um, about, about what he's going to be playing. That's 8 o'clock every night, Sunday to Friday. So please listen in. And thank you again for listening. And do come back to Claire Hall's channel. Um, <laughs> it's not Claire Hall's channel, it's mine. Okay. <laughs> so, but do come back to my channel, please. This, do. Is, this, is, this is Claire Hall, let me say. Um, anyway, whatever it is, um, thank you very much indeed for listening. And um, hope you listen to further um, further presentations. Thank you.